we've got fantastic guests up on this stage throughout the whole of today and tomorrow as well. And without further ado, I'm going to call our next trio of guests up here. Put your hands together. Give a very warm welcome to Marianne Van Hilloos, Joe Laverick, and joining us, the legend that is John Herity. I think we've lost him. We've lost John. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Welcome back to day two. Yes. Thank <laughs> How was you. yesterday? First time at Relay Live. Well, yeah, it was really nice. Yeah, it was, it was a great time and a great vibe. And, and yeah, it was very busy. So it was really nice to see you there. Oh, it's brilliant to have so many people back, isn't it? In yeah. one venue, one arena. Now, John, it's been a little while since we sat down and had a good old natter, isn't it? Um, and you're now back in the ranks of British Cycling with a new role. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm now working for underneath Matt Bramier, which is pretty ironic because he was one of my first riders when I first joined the World Class Performance Programme like 20 odd years ago. So now I work below Matt Bramier, assisting him with the, uh, the current under 23 group of riders. Uh, and yeah, glad to be back involved again. So I'm going to just go from that to right back to the beginning of your racing life, your, your bike riding career. Um, I'm sure most people here followed your racing days, but could you take us back to the moment you signed your first professional contract? How did you make that pathway yourself? Um, a little bit like it's come back, it's almost come full circle really. Um, the only way we could do it back in the sort of early 80s was by going abroad to race and uh, I was, a, a, I think most people know, I was a, a pretty um, basic chef. I, I, I'd gone to catering college straight from school, um, rode a bike as a, just as a, an enthusiast more than anything else, and didn't really have enough time to train, got made redundant, trained um, full time for a little bit, and luckily I was put on an Olympic squad in 1979, fortunate enough to go to uh, the 1980 Olympics in Moscow, and it was kind of like, well, after that, what do I do? What, what's next, sort of thing? And the pathway in those days was like led by uh, Paul Schuing, Graham Jones, and we you know, went over to race in France. So by the end of February in France, we'd already signed myself and Sean Yates, who both went at the same time. We'd both already signed contracts by the end of February to turn pro at the end of that season, which was quite like, it was like amazing, sort of thing. To, to think how it happened, but it was kind of almost by mistake. There was no big master plan. And it's interesting to, you know, having been stayed in the sport for as long as I have, and also works with a lot of young riders, the way that so many of them have these sort of plans, you know, there was no plan on my part. It was all about having fun, enjoying it, which I'm hoping will come out in this sort of uh, conversation we're having today. I think that's really, really important. And I think that's what it was. There was no massive ambition on my part to be a professional cyclist. It was just kind of almost stumbled into it. And to be, to be honest, I wasn't quite good enough to be honest. I, I know that sounds a bit daft given that I had some success, but um, I can only liken it to a little bit like professional footballers that are quite good in the lower divisions. They would get to the top division and they don't quite make it. They might do it. They might be good for one or two seasons, but then they can't. They start having a few picking up injuries and things like that and that's what happened to me really i wasn't good enough to be at that level i didn't have the they the french call it sante they didn't have i didn't have the health system to sort of cope with the the demands of being a professional cyclist it gave me my you know a love for the sport for sure uh, and some really really good knowledge that i've been able to use as a manager i came back to the sport in the uk uh, having did three years in uh, in france and fortunately, the scene in the UK at the time was quite strong. So it was almost like dropping down a couple of divisions in football in terms and being able to extend my career for a couple of seasons doing that. But the, the illnesses kept coming. And so I, um, I actually was asked to be a manager of the team that I was riding for at the time. I got sick during a, a Kellogg's Tour of Britain, which happened to take place in the middle of the year. I think it was in July at the time, July or August. And... I literally halfway through the race, I got off the bike and got into the seat of the team car and was actually managing uh, from the second half of that season. And then we've been in management kind of ever since, really. So really? Quite young, so it's yeah. that quick transition then, right? Yeah. I'm off. <laughs> I was kind of road captain on the road and the manager that we had at the time had another job. So, I mean, the sport was nowhere near as developed as it is now. So 
um, you, you could get away with that back in the, back in the day. So <laughs> and I want to touch upon the Olympic Games. Just how different was that experience, do you think, for you to an Olympic Games now? Uh, well, we're for one thing, they tend not to stay in the village anymore. Uh, you know, the, the, the road teams don't actually get that full-on Olympic experience of living in the village. I think in Moscow, our event was either the last day or the second to last day of, of the Games. So we were there for like four weeks in, uh, in the build-up uh, to it. So there was no racing for four weeks, which is kind of unheard of in this, you know, in this day of age. It, it, certainly a rider would want to race a little bit more than that. Um, and I remember I punctured on the way to the start of the, of, of the game. Of the, we actually rode to the start. So we went from the village, rode there, punctured at the start, and actually had a, a tub changed just before the start of the race. Wow. And uh, they were lining up, and I had a gun pulled on me because they'd all lined up, and I had to go through the finish line, but the army had been told they weren't allowed anybody through. So, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't get through to start the Olympic Games road race. I had to put my bike on my back, run around the, the tribunes, as they're called, to get to the start line, basically. So, yeah, it was... Uh, Interesting experience. <laughs> that is literally filling me with stress, just thinking about changing a tub. Yeah. Right? It was all a big adventure then. I don't think, you know, what I see now with the, the stress that these youngsters have to uh, go through, that, that wasn't, I didn't have that. It was still just a big adventure. You know, so. Joe, how different is it now in terms of how meticulous the preparation is and, and just those fine margins now? Um, well, I haven't had a gun pulled on me, so that's always a good thing. But um, I think now you're, from whatever age you get into the sport, you're just so serious. So from age 15, 16, so then if you haven't won the Tour de France by age 21, it's like, what are you doing in the sport kind of thing, which is, I mean, from John's era is quite different. Even five or six years ago, you had until age of 30, 32 to win the Tour. And now it's like, if you're not won, if you're not won it by 21, 22, as I say, then it's just different. But... I think everything now is just, it seems to be a lot more professional. Everything is tracked. It's like down to your power, your weight. It's like my ring, it tracks my sleep, for example, my heart rate. And it's just, it's so all-encompassing. I say these days, I don't know what it was like before. But even in the last five years I've been in the sport, it has changed from probably slightly more relaxed, where you can get away with not tracking everything. Whereas now, if you actually want to be good, you have to be 100% on it all the time, which just means, like, will guys burn out quicker? Will it end up guys hit their ceiling faster? We don't know yet, but um, yeah, I think it's definitely getting more, more serious, more tracked, and just ev every single aspect of your life is controlled. Which, I mean, some say that's good, some say that's bad. I suppose I'd argue it takes a little bit of the fun out of it. Um, but then, does the top end of professional sport is it always fun? Like. I don't know. Kind of a rhetorical question, I suppose. <laughs> it, it certainly takes a lot, doesn't it? And I, and I think that element of the young riders now, I think people can actually think you're joking, can't they, when you say, oh, this teenager's come into it a bit late, and people are like, are you, are you kidding? But that's, that is the way that we're seeing the sport go now. Um, I know that your philosophy is really fascinating because I do feel like you manage to inject the fun back into that meticulous routine. How do you manage that? Yeah, well, it's it's basically, um, well, it's, I say it to a lot of the young girls that are on my team because the, on, the, on, the, on my team, it's it's basically 18 and 90 year olds are coming in. And I've been racing on, like, the, in, the, in the women's higher level, like, since I was 18. And when I was in then, it's, it's basically what Joe was saying. It's like, yeah, it was laid back, it was fine, it was all good. But then I got into the more professional setting and it just really brought me down it was basically i was like oh i don't want to do this i don't want to weigh myself every day on training camp every morning i had to go on a skill it was written down and then it was like oh you're 500 grams heavier okay it can happen and they're like oh you need to lose weight I'm like, i don't want to hear that every day they're like i had a cup of tea yeah, yeah. it can happen you know and it's it's yeah that that kind of thinking and like those measurements and all that stuff but also with your power if you're not doing the right numbers at the time, it's not the biggest problem. It could be like you're tired, you can be sick, everything can happen. Um, but if you keep focusing on it and keep pushing that way, you can really get the fun out of it. So after that, I was just like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. And then I got to a point that I was like, well, I'm just going to ride 
and I'm just gonna ride with the team. I don't enjoy riding because I love racing. I love racing yeah, so much. And I didn't really enjoy the training because I had to do it. I had to get the numbers, had to do the training. And then actually I was racing and I was like finding the joy in training. So doing nice rides, finding a balance in, in, in doing good training rides and, and getting satisfaction from a training and not just focusing on, shit, I have to get these numbers and all that stuff. So after that, I was just like, as long as I'm happy, as long as I'm enjoying it, then it's good. And I don't want to be only focused on that one goal, that one result, all that stuff. And after that, I started feeling better on the bike, getting better numbers, getting better results, and just focusing on the process, not on the results. Making my whole view on like cycling totally different. So basically, yeah, just enjoying what you're doing, having fun with it, but also you can be professional next to that because you're focusing on the process. You're making yourself professional, but you're enjoying the whole thing. And uh, yeah, I think I'm trying also to tell that to the young girls coming in because they're already on a, on a level that they get at, as a junior, like training with power, having coaches, getting all the, the dietitian advice. And I'm like, well, but are you enjoying it? Is it fun? What are the fun things they're doing? So I think that's, yeah, that's a good thing to look at, yeah, to look at, it, especially as a young rider, because it's not about what you're going to reach on your 20th. It's about what you're going to reach throughout your whole career and how long is that career going to be if you don't enjoy it anymore in your 21st. So really good way of looking at it. And do you, do you have the opportunity to almost mentor and take that role on a little bit for the younger riders? Or is that something you just don't have the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's basically my, one of my roles in the team. So um, I do enjoy it. Um, I've, I've come into the team as kind of a team captain, but I was 24, so I'm not really the age for a team captain. <laughs> I'm 26 now, and, and basically I'm, I'm one of the mums in, in the team, so that's a, it's a weird wow. way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah, it's, but it's, it's, I think it's also how you carry yourself and how uh, I think it's really nice that the girls tell me that, like, okay, we, we feel that you're confident and you're telling us something that we can learn from, and you, like, they see from me that I'm enjoying it, so that's, for me, that's always the main thing. Like, I'm, I, can tell, I can tell them anything, and if they see I don't do it, I, I don't enjoy it, they're not going to take it that advice anyway. But if you take it by heart and, yeah, actually carry it out yourself, it's like leading by example. It's not just telling them what to do, it's showing them how to do it. And that really brings me on to your journey, I guess, with the team that you've been with for the last few years. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of the different guises, I guess, drops would have been the guys when you first joined? Yeah, I've, I've, I've joined Drops. Um, I actually signed with them before, but then they had the, the, the problems with, with the financial problems. And I had to, yeah, to go to that Italian team. Um, and, and I got back to them. And it was basically, well, like, we've got a good program. We've got no money. But we can, like, get you everything you need and just have fun. And I was like, well, well, I've got no other options, and I, I had a good feeling with them, I, and I was in contact with them for a while, so I was just like, why not? Just, just, just try it. And then, yeah, when we got in there, actually, it was, it was COVID, it was 2020, so we did two races, <laughs> and then we didn't race for the rest of the year. But the good thing was, we did the race racing, we had a meeting every week, we met everyone, we made online videos, just we, we kept communicating together. And the next year when we got our team camp, we had such a close bond. We hadn't seen each other all year, but when we started racing in the next season, in 2021, we got a team, which is very weird if you got all these girls that just, they got a contract straight away for the next year because it was COVID times. The team really supported us through it, really stood by us. And then from that confidence, we just build and build and build. And that came out in like, yeah, great results in the end, like in Roubaix and in Women's Tour. And I think, yeah, you can really, really tell when a team gives you confidence. You can build on that. And prior to 2020, you weren't entirely sure what direction you were going to take with the sport, whether you would keep pushing to progress. Yeah, yeah, because um, in my first few years of cycling, I was a club rider in Holland and I did my uh, physical therapy degree. Um, which I'm, I'm a physical therapist now and, and I, still, <laughs> I still work because not because I need it now, financially, but just because I enjoy it. Um, but it's, it's basically how we, yeah, at, th at that point I was like, well, I might as well become a physical therapist now, because don't enjoy cycling, 
not making any money of it. <laughs> so might as well get, yeah, earn some money. And actually, I had people telling me, like, if you ever want to buy a house, you better start working now because, yeah, what are you going to do with cycling? And that was how we looked at women cycling back then, too. It's just, yeah, you're not going to earn any money from it. It's nice. It's a nice hobby, but might as well start working now. Um, and yeah, that's not really good motivator if you want to keep, yeah, keep going. We're going to come back in a moment to your results because, as you said, keeping it fun definitely worked for you. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. But Joe, I'd like to go back to your first signing of a contract um, here in the UK for Madison. Can you tell us about your pathway into the sport? Um, well, from the start, um, I, my family has nothing to do with cycling. I accidentally fell into it. I don't know how, probably the Wiggins effect. And then... Um, just one thing led to another, led to another, spiraled out of control, and now I'm sitting here pretending I know what I'm on about. Um, but my first contract came after, it was for Madison Genesis, and I had a good second year as a junior. Um, I actually tried to speak to John about signing for him, um, and then it turned out JLT Condor weren't carrying on, and luckily Colin Sturgis offered me a place on Madison, and I was actually full-time school at the time, doing my A-levels, and it was a school break or a fire drill or something, and I remember Sturge calling me and was like, are we signing this thing or not? And I was like, okay, yeah, we'll sign it. And it was kind of that simple. Um, I mean, yeah, it's you, you think for so long as junior, you're like, I just need to sign a Conti contract. I need to sign any contract. And I just remember the feeling of relief when I finally agreed with Colin to, to ride for Madison for the year. And obviously knowing what we know now that Madison stopped after that was my first was there last year. Um, but when I signed, it was... The plan was to do all my U23 years there, um, kind of move the squad slightly to a U23 squad, um, or kind of mix the two. And I don't know, I was like, I was looking there, the riders we had, um, Ian Bibby, John Mould, who's here somewhere today, and I was kind of like, I don't know, like a kid with like a bowl of popcorn or something, like looking at all these guys, and I was like, wow, I'm going to be riding with these boys, which as a junior, you're like, wow. But now it's like, the British scene, I mean, maybe we'll go on to this later, it's changed slightly in the last three or four years, I think. Yeah, and I'm sure we will come on to that. But next, I'd like to know about where you went as, a, again, under-23 rider, under the guidance of Axel Merckx. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know, I currently do ride um, for Hagen's Bermany Axion. So they're a good American U23 team. I actually leave next year because I'm aging out. But Axel is one of these guys who, I mean, he's done everything he has in the sport and he's got a a very, very good record of his team has been just producing good riders and both on the bike and off the bike. And I've got so much respect for what Axel has done with the team. Um, even from the early days, like Taylor Finney went through the team, Alex Dalsit, um, I mean, Theo Gegenhart, like, I mean, the teams were monuments, grand tours. And Axion, again, when, it, when Axel called me, I was actually, funnily enough, I was on a night out when Axel called me um, to sign the contract because he was in Canada. And I was living in France at the time. And it was off-season, and I was a fair few deep. And I remember going to the toilet, kind of throwing some water on my face, like sobering up. And I was like, he was like, hey, it's Axel Merckx. I was like, oh my god, wow. I like, when I left juniors, it was always my dream to ride for Axion. Is that how you picked up the phone? Oh my god. And then I was like, hey, Axel, how's it going? Like, trying to <laughs> play it cool. cool yeah? I think my third line was like, just a heads up, mate. I'm, I'm a few pints deep. It's like 11 p.m. where I am. But when Axel calls, you don't, like, you don't be like, oh, I'll call you tomorrow because he just wants to sign the contract. And I think within a couple of minutes, he was like, stay to the team at the minute. We've got a calendar until Nationals, which is in June. We don't know if we're going to get the funding, but the offer's there if you want it. And I mean, I don't think any U23 in the world is going to turn down Axel. Um, say, it's just the history he's had and the guy he is, the connections he has. And it's just Axel and Coast Murrenhout as well, who's our other DS. They're just a great combination for developing riders. And they're actually trying to take it away from power which is because they're relatively old school, those guys, and they think it's bad that we're all focusing on power these days. Um, so they're trying to take us away from that, which is it's really nice, actually. Really interesting. And, and what, I guess this is a tricky question, but what did it take for you to get noticed by Axel? What, you know, what was that journey like for you? How did you stand out? Because it's not easy to be signing into these contracts as a development rider. No, and to be honest, it was like probably a little bit of luck as well. Um, I mean, Axion at the time were in the process of folding, and like, I think they did want a British rider, but they didn't know, say they didn't know if the team was going ahead. And like a lot of things in this sport, if you're, if you're extremely talented, got the results, you can pretty much sign anything you want. Like 
Tom Pickock's never going to struggle to find a contract, is he? But then I think for the rest of us, it's, it's as much your ability on the bike, your ability off the bike, right place, right time. And I think everything just kind of married together for me. And yeah, so whether that's look, skill, judgment, a mixture of the three, like having someone you can put a word in, um, everything comes together to help for sure. And I know that the title of this talk is Racing Outside of the World Tour and that cycling pyramid to, you know, to escalate, to climb up, to develop yourself. But not everyone sat here will probably understand the, the differentiation between a, a pro Conti team, a World Tour level. Could you explain and give a bit of context? Because I know this is something you've written about quite a lot. That's like, how long have we got? Um, <laughs> it's kind of like, pretty basically, World Tour teams, they all have to get paid, do the World Tour races, the Tour, the Giro, etc. Pro Conti teams, it's like they can still be invited for, um, for the big races, the tour, etc. Again, still have a minimum wage. And then you get to Conti, and it's just a wild west. Um, I think that's the only way of describing it. You can have teams, for example, like Axion, who are, they have a great setup, like everything's in place. Then you have other teams where, I don't know, not the best of setups is the nicest way of putting it. Um, and then a lot of teams falling in the middle. But I think the biggest thing with Conti is the fact that they don't have to pay the riders. So you have, I'd say most Conti riders are trying to juggle two jobs, but we can still race the pros. So it's like my last race of the season, I was racing against Matthew van der Poel in his final race for did Worlds. And he probably makes more in a day than I make in a year. And it's like this weird, like you can race the best in the world, but you're not, you're not there, but you are there. It's like a very unusual mixture of the two. Well, I, a quote that you made that I quoted back to you earlier was that, it's all right, it's all right, <laughs> don't look too worried, was that you could be racing Chris Froome one day and Chris from, you know, the local TT the next day. And, and I think that's what people maybe struggle to understand with that level of racing, is that it can be a complete skipping level. You sign a contract, you're perceived as a, a professional rider, but actually there, there is still a big gap there. And that's what I love about cycling is, like... I'm a time trialist, I hate to admit it, and I can still go home and race the Club 10 on Tuesday night um, against people who that's like just social riders, and then at the weekend, say I can be racing whoever, like Alaphilippe, I can be racing the world champion. And I, I think that's what I love about cycling, actually, the fact that you can do the two, because, I mean, maybe you can play five aside with some of the, like with some footballers, but realistically, you're not able to, to bounce between the two. And I think that's why cycling is so magical but also it is weird how you're perceived in one place to be in this pro and then at the other place you're perceived to just be in this conti rider because there's def world tour teams definitely i mean you could argue rightly so they definitely flick us um more often than not let's say and Marilyn, i guess the interesting aspect for you in in the women's peloton is again from the outside people might see the level of your team as a registered team and then see you racing the Tour de France, bam, avec Swift and Paris Roubaix, and doing very, very well. And you are riding the absolute pinnacle, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I think the setup um, from the women's is a bit different to the men's, and, and people forget that sometimes because, um, yeah, we don't have a pro Conti level, so it's basically Conti and World Tour. So it's yeah, World Tour and the Wild West, and it's all together, and it's just fighting for your spot and hoping that you get into races, um, which is quite interesting to see because uh, people see the roller teams and they're like, oh, that's, that's great, that's like uh, equal pay, like everything's well arranged. But there's actually Conti teams that are on that level and on like have everything well sorted out, like my team and we're, we're straight up there. But there's 50 other Conti teams and they're all not at the same level. It's, it's from everywhere between maybe just a club team level, which people have their own bikes, they don't have equipment, they don't have staff, they don't have anything. They need to pay for the, their way to get there. But they can race those races, and if they get the right connections, they can be doing 1.1 races on big levels, racing the world tour teams on their own bike that they bought with their own kit, with their own stuff. And yeah, getting on that level, and it's basically also what is quite, yeah, quite different in, in the women's peloton. And which is also a thing that we should be moving towards more of like the yeah divided system in between that because also for the for the under twenty three riders 
there's no under 23 category in, in, in women's cycling. So there's no, yeah, the, the world this year was the first time there was a world under 23 jersey for the, for the women's. Yeah. Tour de la Venier has come in for the women's, which is a great addition. But other than that, there's one women under 23 race like in the season, which the girls would get really excited about. But that's the only one time that those young girls that get into the pro peloton, racing against Annemiek van Vleuten and Marianne Voss, and get their own race and actually get to ride for the win. So I think in that perspective, it's really good if we have a bit of yeah, different leveling. And for people, it can look like you're like, oh, you're just on a Conti team. Like how you say, like, oh, people can, can look at a Conti team and you're like, oh, Okay, you're not quite there, um, but we're racing on the level of a world tour team. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's perceived in different ways. And yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a way it needs to grow. Um, but also, like, in the peloton, we know, like, we know who's there and, and what we're doing. And we're developing and it's, and it's going in the right direction. It certainly is, but you and the team must be so proud of what you're achieving. You really must, because, I mean, the way you're punching is, is just phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the way we're, like, we're aiming to get, get higher and higher, and, and that's what we've been doing. We've been, we've been going up the charts. We're in top 15 uh, teams now, which is crazy, because there's, there's only 14, 15 World Tour teams, so we're in there um, with, with the budget that we have and, and the content team we have. And, and it's like, like we say, it's small teams. It's, 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 it's two, like maximum two Swannies. Uh, it's, it's one mechanic and that's it. And that's, what, that's how we do it. But it's, it's, we, we get around and we're building and we're building and we're growing as a team. And it's crazy that we're getting top five at Tour de France. That, that's mental. Getting a, a white jersey on Champs-Élysées. That's crazy. Like, but all that stuff, we're like, we've got the, the capabilities. And we're just going to go there. We're going to do it. And then, yeah, we'll see how it goes. I think you're more than getting around. I think that's a very, very modest understatement. And you touched upon the Tour de France there. When it was announced, it was confirmed. We had the dates. We had the, the release of the route. When did you personally find out, right, I'm confirmed, I'm in, I'm oh, riding? Oh, I, I, I know. It's, uh, well, that, I didn't know I was in yet. But I was riding with Lizzie Holden in Belgium. We were in the team house. We are doing the training ride. And she had her wahoo, and she had a <laughs> message pop up from our DS. We're in the tour. And we were basically screaming on the bike. We're like, oh, yes, we're, we're going to tour front. I was like, at that stage, not knowing if we were going. But we were so excited for the team, and we know how hard we worked for it. Um, and yeah, I found out a few weeks before I've, uh, I would go on the re recce's, and, and I was really excited about it, especially about Champs Elysees. Um, and yeah, I was just, I, I actually never thought I would be in the team. Uh, so that was so excited and yeah, it was, it was great. And I've alluded to your fantastic result in the inaugural Paris-Roubaix as well. And you got 13th, top 20 in that first ever edition of the race. And those conditions, I mean, <laughs> we saw Lizzie Dijkman out front just slipping and sliding her way to that victory. I think we've got images coming up now. I mean, it looked absolutely brutal. And that was Lizzie having a free reign, her own yeah. path. I mean, on the wheel, in the wheels. I mean, how was that day? Carnage. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was mental. But it was actually because I got lucky a few times. Like, I've, I've, I've had a few almost crashes. Like, I, I don't know if you remember the crash from Alan van Dijk on one of the last sectors, that really slippy one. I was just behind it, and I could barely break enough because you don't want to break on wet cobbles. And you're, like, trying to not break too much, but you're trying not to crash into it. So it's, it's balancing, and, and it's, it's basically about power, but also about thinking and, 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 and reacting, responding, and just constantly you're, you're working your way through. And the nice thing is that, you, yeah, it's, it's basically like a cyclocross race because you're choosing your lines and you're not caring about anyone else. But it's also you need to like work together and that kind of stuff. So I think that was really, really cool to try, yeah, try and do that. And you certainly turned a lot of heads with that result. Um, what happened next? Did the phone start ringing? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, basically, uh, that evening I was in a camper van going to Britain, going through the tunnel. Uh, because we were starting women's tour like two days later, so uh, that was great, and uh, I got sick, <laughs> and yeah, I was just getting a lot of responses, which was quite, yeah, I, d I didn't know what to do with it, because I basically got a lot of people saying, 
what is this? And where you come from? And what have you been doing? And I've been like, well, I've been here like since 2018 and it's like been riding these races, but finally got the chance to actually do the stuff I love to do and I'm good at. So yeah, I finally had my little breakthrough moment and I actually took that with me in, in women's tour and, and got three, yeah, top, yeah, top tens in the, in the sprint finishes, um, which was really nice to do that on a world tour level. And you decided to stick with the team and sign in again. Yes, yeah, I, I, I got the confidence from the team and especially with, with those kind of things, you don't, sometimes you don't see how much effort goes into something like Rubé. The team is built around you. I had girls like fully like putting me on the front for the couple sections, so I was in the perfect position. The, 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 the tires, the wheels, we had the reckoning days with Mavic. They brought their motorbikes, they brought everything to make sure that we were okay, we had the right tire pressure. All the, the preparation that goes into that is all but done by the team, and they put so much confidence in me, in my capabilities. I was like, oh, I was riding that race. I was like, oh, come, like, drop now, because like, we did put so much effort into this. Um, yeah, that's basically why, yeah, you feel, okay, this team, they put so much effort in the details that matter. It's not about, like, oh, I need to get this amount of money and all that, that stuff. It's also about that, but it's basically about what do I need? Is that all there? And do they care about that stuff? And they do, and they support me, and they give me confidence. And the team all around it is very, yeah, just, just the whole atmosphere is, is the right thing for me. Joe mentioned earlier, John, that he wanted to ride for you. And I know you'll be modest, but from my point of view, interviewing John throughout many, many seasons, you know, you were that manager, that DS that stood out. People wanted to ride for your team. And talking about, um, you know, Murray Lyon's team punching above weight in the racing, you managed a team under, again, various guises under the Condor sponsorship that really did punch above its weight. Can you give us a bit of insight as to how you manage the challenges of running a team at that level so successfully? Uh, it's about managing the budget you're given at the start of the year. It's as simple as that, really. Uh, there was an interview done with Cycling News a couple of days ago where Fabian Cancellara spoke about setting up the, the new Tudor team that he's, he's with. And he was talking about getting the infrastructure of those teams right you know, in the first place. So you spend money making sure that aspect of it is life. And actually, my philosophy is the riders are actually coming last, which kind of <laughs> might be a little bit surprising to some people. But I believe in, personally, in getting the infrastructure of that team right, first of all. Uh, and then after that, then making sure you're meeting the sponsor's needs. Um, I've been fortunate to work with a number of really, really good sponsors over the years. Um, in particular, um, Simon Mottram, who's here today, was on stage just before us. Simon at Rafa was uh, instrumental in the image of that team. But the first person that helped me was Charlie Jackson, who I think is actually in the audience here today from uh, recycling.co.uk. And we had a relatively small budget. Um, certainly in today's terms we did. Back then it was still you know, pretty good. But we didn't try and be something that we weren't. We knew we didn't have you know, a great deal of money. So I tried to, I remember forcing Charlie to buy us a better team car when he didn't really want us to. Um, and it was a really, really nice car, but I also remember it had a little leak in, in the boot of it. <laughs> and we used to get this pool of water where the mechanic sat in it. And it, it got to, so bad at one point that Chris Newton, one of our riders, who was a bit of a practical joker, put some crest seeds in there to try and grow some crest <laughs> in, from where the mechanic sat sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so when I talk about like the, the cutting your cough accordingly sort of thing, but uh, in, with Charlie, he was very much, he, he wanted to uh, support the scene here in the UK very much. So we, we, we got riders in that could do that. And like Joe's told you already, we, you, know, you don't have to pay riders at continental level. Um, at the, at Rafa Condor at its height paid all its riders. But in those early days, you know, we didn't, everyone got expenses and so on. We, we met all the UCI regulations for a continental team. But um, for me, it was all about getting that infrastructure right. Uh, in those first years with uh, recycling and then with Rafa and Condor, they were, um, we, they wanted to connect with the public, in particular Rafa and Condor. That was really, really important to them, which became a problem later on 
because as the sport grew, uh, everyone was getting team buses and things like that. And I did not want a team bus. I didn't want a, a camper van at all. I hated the damn things. I just thought they were a waste of money. I would have liked you to have money. a team bus on all those rainy mornings that we interviewed outside. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought they were a waste of money, you know. And then we came to, we did the Tour of Yorkshire one year and um, we were the only team in the car park with our backsides out in the, you know, in the fact there was like, 20,000 people in Round A Park and we're the only team there with like getting changed outside taking our kit off so uh, yeah I had to speak to, this, <laughs> I had to speak to the sponsors about that and I, I it was kind of a I remember we won a tour series one year and uh, uh, Grant Young from Condors came to it and he, he phoned me after it and he wasn't bothered about the fact that we'd won the race. He was more, he was a lot happier to see Ed Clancy, the Olympic champion, leaning over a barrier an hour after the race, still speaking to spectators. And that was, that's what it was all about with them, about connecting. So we, I was always like very, very strong with the sponsors and finding out what they wanted. In the UK scene, at its height, we had the, the Tour Series and the Tour of Britain. And the two, don't for me, don't really go together. You know, one's a crit rider, one's a stage race rider. Yeah. But you're one team and you, you're trying to do both of them. So I remember banging the table a number of times at the start of a... Start, not even the start of the season, you usually did it in October, saying, well, what do you want next year? Do you still want to go for the, you know, the Tour Series or, or do you want to go more for the Tour of Britain? And because um, that then determined how you spent your budget, the riders that you tried to engage on the team after that as well. Uh, so I think that, that was being clear with your sponsors about what their ambitions are and what they wanted. And certainly, in particular, Rafa and Condor, they really wanted, for, um, they really wanted to branch out in Asia. So we were lucky to go to, a, um, you know, to, to, to ride in those, you know, on those continents, if you like. And that was, that was sponsor driven. That wasn't me thinking, oh, I like a nice trip to Taiwan or something like that. It was like, that wasn't That's it. Lovely. That was actually, so when we got there, there was events organized for us. We were, certainly when we went to the Tour of Korea the first time, I thought we thought we were the Beatles. It was like, it was incredible. The number of people that were there that were like, came to see us. We, we went to a, a bike shop when we just thought we were going to sign a few, you know, they were joking about it. And there's like 300 people outside this bike shop waiting to see us. Paul Smith, who was just on the stage before that, they did a collaboration with Rafa with some bags that were made with the team pictures, you know, a team picture. It was a generic picture that, that was sold in the shops. That, and there was these Koreans come up to us, this 300 pound bag with our faces on it, wanting us to sign the bag with a felt, it was almost ruining this, what we felt was ruining this Paul Smith bag for them, but that's, that's what they wanted. It was like, so it, it was very much sponsor driven. So even though it was a continental team, and we're trying to provide a pathway for riders to move on that Joe's again spoken about. Uh, it was also about satisfying the needs of our sponsors as well. And fortunately, we, we did manage to move some riders up to World Tour. And that's probably my biggest regret that we didn't move more riders up to that, uh, you know, to the next level sort of thing. Because at the end of the day, that's what a continental team should be about. It's about a pathway and giving riders opportunities in races. Slightly different for the women because you've got this overlap at the moment because it's the sport's still growing there at, at, at that level, I think. Uh, I'm not a, an expert in that area, so I don't want to get myself into any more trouble there. <laughs> um, but that, that pathway was there for us. We gave riders opportunities, but we perhaps didn't attract the top riders. They wanted to go to you know, teams like Axles and so on because there was a Axles connections meant if a rider did do a good ride, one phone call from him, and they were signed. One phone call from me, they would be going to you know, who the hell are you sort of thing. They wouldn't even know who I was sort of thing. So it was a little bit, yeah. So that's probably my only regret, really, having the team for as long as we did. We didn't move riders. However, we, we did move a lot of staff, believe it or not. A lot of staff that we've had uh, have gone on to, to work at World Tour level, which I still take as a, a kind of a comp compliment, to be honest. You, you, again, you've given people an opportunity to stay in the sport and um, we've touched on enjoyment as well that was a big thing if you, if you don't enjoy it it's, not, it's too hard to actually to stay involved it is, or if you, if it is. and I think it's it. so significant of course we're talking about pathway getting up to the world or getting up to the very top but there's so much in between that so much passion love staff moving into different yeah. realms people discovering new passions I think it's fantastic on that note we're out of time please join me in saying a big thank you put your hands together for our guests John Joe and Marie Thank you guys.